Buju Nijiwag, Miigwech Bezindawi Agnungum. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Katrina Phillips, Assistant Professor of History at McAllister College, and I will be your moderator for a conversation about Confederate monuments and memory. I want to acknowledge that even though this is a virtual event, the Minnesota Historical Society is located on the traditional territory of many nations and on the homeland of the ancestral lands of the Dakota people who still continue to call this region home. We pay our respects to the indigenous ancestors of this place. This is the second event in an ongoing series called Shared Spaces and Public Places. If you joined us for the first session, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're happy to have you with us today. Each month, I'll be joined by scholars, artists, and community members for a conversation about local as well as national issues. We'll start with a moderated discussion followed by Q&A. So please submit your questions and share this important content with your friends in real time. Joining me today are Dr. Melanie Adams and Dr. Yohuro Williams. Dr. Melanie Adams currently serves as the director of the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. Before joining the Smithsonian, Melanie served as the deputy director for learning initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society, overseeing the state's 26 historic sites. Prior to Minnesota, Melanie spent 12 years at the Missouri Historical Society as the Managing Director for Community Education and Events. Dr. Yohuro Williams is the Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History and the Founding Director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Williams has appeared on a number of local and national radio and TV programs on ABC, CNN, C-SPAN, and NPR, and is the author of, most recently, Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement. He also hosts the History Channel's web show, Sound Smart. So thank you both for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you, and I can't wait for the conversation we're going to have today. And so the first question I kind of want to pose to the two of you is kind of, let, let's do a little bit of, of historical context here for, for our audience today. So what is it about these monuments? You know, who put them there? Where are they? When did they go up and why? Well, I'm happy to start a little and then kick it over to Dr. Williams. Um, I think this is a really important question because a lot of people make the assumptions that these monuments were put up um, you know, weeks after the Civil War happened, when really the, a lot of them were put up in the early um, 20th century and really put up in places, again, while you'll find some, with some both north and south, as a reminder um, to the newly freed African Americans of their place. Um, so they were never meant to recognize or create um, kind of memorials for the individuals they were put up for, but really more as reminders for the enslaved individuals to remain in their place, which is why they were put up decades um, after the Civil War, and usually by organizations that were supporting the lost cause, such as the Daughters of the American Revolution. Yeah, and I, I would agree with uh, Melanie. They tend to follow, um, not shortly after the Supreme Court's decision in Plessy versus Ferguson. So they're monuments to white supremacy. Uh, they are markers and memorials to the lost cause in the sense that they reimagine the Civil War as a contest between two well-intentioned um, sides, uh, giving legitimacy to the South and legitimacy to the South's cause, while at the same time commemorating, memorializing people um, like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and others who were in essence rebels who had rebelled against the United States government by waging war against the United States government. So you have organizations like the Daughters of the Confederacy and others raising money to put up these, in many cases, cheaply made uh, monuments to mark space in the public square to, in that sense, even though they lost the war, win the peace and remembering the war, again, as this noble contest between two well-intentioned sides in which ultimately the South what lost, but was right and just in its pursuit of liberty. So then how do you see how these monuments kind of uphold white supremacy? You know, you've, you've given us some great background on where and when a lot of these monuments went up, but how do we see monuments upholding white supremacy? And also why are we taught the narrative that we were taught? 
they in, in many ways come to symbolize uh, what I like to call the six degrees of segregation. And as Melanie uh, pointed out, when you think about where you most often encounter these monuments, markers, and memorials, they're in public spaces and shared spaces. So the town square, the post office, government buildings. And they are an affirmation in some sense of number one, the, the rightness of the Southern cause in that endeavor, but a reminder to African-Americans in particular that ultimately their place was set off, uh, uh, set aside, and you know, um, relative to that period in time, uh, second-class citizens. When we look at it in that way, uh, these monuments in many ways um, occupy space in areas where as citizens, you know, as, as equal um, uh, partners in our democratic practice, it was a stark reminder of the fact that you were separate but equal, that your citizenship uh, wasn't equal to that of whites. And in that sense, when you saw people um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, for example, um, most recently, uh, as we're talking about Black Lives Matter, target these statues, they were doing so because, you know, for many generations, um, we're talking about after the Civil War, but for at least two generations, these have been kind of ubiquitous symbols of white supremacy and white power in America. And I think that comment around power is just really important there because I think when you're looking at these monuments and memorials, it is talking about um, this power that even though they lost, that they are still able to instill decades, um, even a century um, later among the people. And also these monuments and memorials don't reflect, I think they're coming down now because they're not reflecting the values of the community. And I would even question, did they reflect the values of all of the communities when they were put up? Um, and so now I think more individuals are really looking at kind of what does our community mean? What does it be, mean to be a member of our community? And how do we value everyone in our community? And these monuments, it doesn't matter if it makes one person uncomfortable or a million, you still need to be able to hear that voice. And I think that's one of the things that's really happening now. And Melanie speaks to two really important things. We never think about process in, in terms of how these monuments went up. In many instances, there wasn't any political process. Oh, no. You could raise the money and you could you know, find a place to put this and there was very little pushback against that. So they weren't reflective of, of community norms and values as a, as a whole. They didn't have to be inclusive. Uh, they could have a, a political message embedded deeply just in the fact that the people they were commemorating. We also have to remember that, as Melanie um, indicated, when we talk about the civil rights movement, for example, we just lost Congressman John Lewis. Um, he spills blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after a Confederate um, war hero. So in that sense, and I use the term hero uh, loosely, um, in that sense, even during the civil rights era, as you had African-Americans contesting for equal citizenship, trying to ensure uh, through the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that they would dismantle uh, Jim Crow segregation as they knew it, they were doing so in the shadow of the commemoration of Civil War icons who in some sense mocked the very enterprise that they were undertaking and trying to make uh, the promises of reconstruction real in that, in that era. You're, you're both talking a lot about how not only the creation of these statues, but also their continued presence in what are meant to be public places, meant for members of all communities, still resonate today. And we've got some images that we'd like to show because mm -hmm. in our conversations leading up to this, we've talked about how this manifests itself in mainstream media and how we see it manifested in culture as well. That's a great one. I mean, you know, we talk about how this plays out in terms of those markers and memorials, but that interpretation of the Civil War filtered not only into the public square in terms of these monuments, but also into the academy uh, in terms of the books and, and articles that were published by scholars supporting this cause or this idea of the lost cause. It certainly played out in literature and in movies. So mm -hmm. Birth of the Nation is the nation's first blockbuster and it tells um, for lack of a better term, a very problematic and idealized history of reconstruction with the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes. And in Gone with the Wind, which again, commemorates and memorializes this idealized South in which white supremacy was benevolent, in which African-Americans are, are the enslaved were happy. And it ultimately, um, this was a, a harmless system and one that benefited everyone because it um, relegated blacks to their natural place. Right. 
And I think that's important as you're looking at also very similar to the monuments and memorials when these types of um, whether it was literature or movies came out, what was happening in the US during that time where they felt that they had to produce something like a birth of a nation or gone with the wind. And especially if you look at something around birth of a nation, um, just knowing a little bit about it and St. Louis, you're looking at like a 19, uh, 1916, 1917, it's being shown there at the same time, you're talking about housing and redlining and discrimination. So it's this constant reminder, like you think you've made a little bit of progress and then something like this comes out that that reminds people that, oh, okay, we need to keep a certain population in their place. Um, and it also goes without saying, you know, that was the first movie that was shown at the White House. So what does that say that of all the movies, this is the first one that was shown? And, and to your point, Melanie, one of the things that always strikes me about that being screened in the White House is Woodrow Wilson's response. So here's the former president of Princeton University, Southerner by birth, who says he sees Birth of a Nation, says it's like um, writing history with lightning. But he's also the first president that will introduce segregation into the District of Columbia. So that movie has real consequences in real time for people of color. I also think it's interesting, uh, something you raised the other day, so many African-American activists, so many of the women and men that we celebrate, people like Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Turrell, um, and others, Alice Dunbar Nelson, you know, began their activism around uh, contesting movies like Birth of a Nation and joining organizations to challenge this myth, this narrative about a benevolent South and, and the harmless nature of slavery and these representations of slavery. Well, and I think um, it gets to um, Katrina's point about kind of how did we learn this? It's innocuous. Like, so yes, you probably learned something a little more tame in your history books, but when you're being inundated with this type of information day in, day out, you are learning it without even realizing you're learning it. Um, so it really isn't that hard to have people think that this is the true narrative um, of the war when this is what you're seeing all around you, whether it's children's books, games, songs. I mean, there are a variety of different genres that are supporting this narrative. And to your point, I think about how Katrina opened us today uh, by commemorating what this space represents to the Dakota people. Right. I think about Stokely Carmichael in 1966 talking about the insidious nature of Tarzan movies and how they impacted the psyche of African Americans. You know, I don't. I know that as a person of color, it's hard for me to imagine swimming in Lake Calhoun and feeling good about that if I know anything about the history of John C. Calhoun, the Fort Hill Address, and his position on slavery. But to your point, Melanie. These things become so ingrained and then people don't question that we find ourselves in spaces all the time that commemorate, honor and memorialize um, individuals and events and institutions and structures that we should all be uncomfortable with. Right. And you've, you've both made really incredible and insightful points about not only the moments in which these memorials and monuments are constructed and also who's kind of leading the charge on these, but one thing that's really fascinating that we've been talking about and that I'd like to ask you to speak to a little bit more is this mythology around the permanence of these statues. And it's been really fascinating to learn about. And I, I think our audience would really benefit from hearing you talk about that a little bit. I'll let you hear, I'll go first on this one. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's interesting. Um, and, you know, Melanie is both a scholar and museum professional, understands this perhaps better than anyone, that there's no permanence to exhibits, no permanence to anything. I mean, communities all the time reimagine themselves and reimagine what represents their values as a society and a culture. The only space where we've seen a pseudo permanence is in these types of statues. And it was never intended to be the case. The reality is, as we've seen with Blake Calhoun here in Minnesota, a community should have the opportunity um, at regular intervals to revisit its symbols and, its, um, and, and to question whether those symbols still represent the values of that community. We've seen universities undertake this. So Yale University changed the name of Calvin College to Pauli Murray College, much more appropriate and fitting a symbol for that university today, honoring one of its graduates. Uh, we saw the conversation here in Minnesota, which was, was um, highly appropriate. So. The idea that somehow these statues were there for all time, that they can't be removed from the public square, that somehow it's squatters' rights, um, would be you know, kind of colonized history in the same way that we're talking about decolonizing the curriculum by putting the voices of Native Americans and African Americans and women back in an organic way that doesn't emphasize oppression but talks about agency 
we can also be agents of taking these symbols out of the public square and saying, this doesn't represent our values anymore. Um, we want things that are representative of who we are, what we aspire to be, which should be a natural part of the democratic uh, process. Right, and I think from the museum perspective, the, for, the rally cry is always put it in the museum. And I always want to say, we don't want them. <laughs> I mean, because I think in my mind then what that tells me is the community thinks museums are where old racist things go to die or, you know, and we necessarily, museums, we're trying to be relevant in, in this moment. Um, that doesn't mean we don't use the past to talk about the present, but that doesn't mean as I think you heard mentioned, we want kind of bad sculptures. Um, and then you have that discussion around, well, you can reinterpret it. And as we've said before, you can, there are a lot of other ways you can teach this history that did not involve a statue and you're not learning the history from the statue. So why are we trying to keep it? Like, why are we just so intent on, we can take it down, but we have to put it somewhere. Whereas I don't think that happens with other types of um, monuments and memorials. And I think it really is important to get, I've been trying to play around with that distinction between monument and memorial and kind of what's the difference. And I keep thinking of memorial is something more, I think where we celebrate the humanity of the common man. So I think of like the 9-11 is a memorial <laughs> because those are individual, those are ordinary people who made, who made sacrifice versus these monuments, as you said um, at the beginning, really were kind of something for us to worship may not be the right word, but they're not really a memorial to something we want to hold dear and remember. You know, I agree with you, Melanie, they're political statements. Now right. on a battlefield like Gettysburg, uh, we know the history of that battlefield when those monuments were erected there, you know, they weren't just regimental histories that people were memorializing. They were political statements about how, what their state stood for, about mm -hmm. what they valued in those moments. I'm fine with that on a battlefield, but, um, and you know, the Anacostia is one of the finest museums in the country. Um, and certainly in the District of Columbia, we recognize that it's limited real estate in that space. Right. So the idea that somehow we'll transfer all these, you know, markers and monuments, memorials to those spaces, and then not allow the professionals in those spaces to create interpretive exhibits that would speak to the community, right. is ridiculous. Right. At the same time, you know, we're watching what's playing out in New York City with the Teddy Roosevelt statue. Yeah. You know, I think those conversations are, are very productive. And I think at the end of the day, if there's something that we can say about those statues that have kind of an overarching value in terms of who the sculptor was, or, right. you know, then I think it's appropriate for us to at least have a conversation about maybe some place where that could sit to, to, to commemorate the other pieces of that, which are historically significant. Beyond that, most of these things are cheap crap, and I hate to put right. it that way. And you know they don't deserve to take up space, um, especially in institutions like the Anacostia uh, and other museums, which really are the only spaces dedicated to telling the story of people of color. Right, and well, I think it's a, the thread that's running through this conversation. It's all about context. Um, and so, as you've mentioned, the context on which a lot of these statues were created, when, where, why, it's all about the context. It's not just moving them to another space and telling the other side of the story. But I also question what is the need for monuments? Because I think um, thinking about Richmond, they decided to put up, I think it's Rumors of War by Kahindi Wiley. And I feel like it's, you know, it's a wonderful statue, but now there's more attention being paid to how they re, they're they reimagining the Robert E. Lee statue by um, putting displays on it. So is, it the, is the answer statue for statue or is it something else? So no, I agree. I think the statue for statue is problematic because it puts us in a, you know, um, that is equal time that we right. have today where, you know, you, you get to say something outrageous and then somebody else gets to respond to it. And my problem with that, as you all well know, is that, you know, we can put up Arthur Ashe and, you know, half a dozen other people of color in that space to offset. Uh, and people claim that that's telling the full story of, of America. I don't think it is because you're still creating space to commemorate a group of people that made war against the union, that made war against core democratic values, American, all of its imperfections, at least can claim that, you know, we've put that Confederate past behind us and we don't celebrate people like Alexander Stevens or um, Robert E. Lee, uh, who made the argument that, you know, slavery was the cornerstone of the new government they wanted to found or were fighting in support of that. Right. And, you know, just, 
to go off what the, this conversation that, that we're having here, um, if we can put up the image we have of the Robert E. Lee statue that, that we've been having this conversation around, and just to see how this monument has been, in a sense, transformed. And you can see what happens when a statue like this serves a different purpose. Mm -hmm. And it starts to show how a monument like this can, in a sense, become more of a shared space where it might not have earlier been allowed to be considered something like that. Well, exactly. I think it's been reclaimed by the community. And on any given evening, you'll see a different projection um, because when um, John Lewis passed away, his image was up there. And so I think it is this wonderful kind of living um, memorial um, to people. And it's a way, obviously, that the community wants to use that space. And so again, it's the question of, do you pull the whole thing down? Do you leave it up and let it continue to have the projections? Um, but it is showing how the community is reclaiming their space and the values they want for that space. You know, I, I agree with you, Melanie. And what I love about this is, is something you mentioned the other day. This moves from this kind of immovable fixed structure to a canvas. Right. And at any moment, you can project onto that canvas anything that is reflective of you know, social issues, um, issues of political import, issues of, of historical significance. Um, in some sense, in a technological age, this is what we would imagine would be an appropriate way to think about a use of public space that could be uplifting, um, that could communicate values, but at the same time could, be, could pivot uh, to work toward um, other issues. Mm -hmm. So I love this in terms of, as you said, this kind of reimagination of the space and, and being reflective, not only of the value shift in this moment, but also this kind of reimagination of public space and how it's used and utilized by the people who live in that community. So we've talked, this has been a great conversation looking at these national issues, these monuments, this conversation between North and South and how that plays out in the historical narrative and in popular culture. And so now I kind of want to bring us a little bit closer to home, bring us a little <laughs> back to Minnesota a little bit. And so we don't really tend to think about Minnesota's connection to the Civil War. But when you look at something like Fort Snelling and you recognize and you start to see the historical foundations, not only with the creation of Fort Snelling, but also what it was used for that also kind of shifts this conversation as far as not only what Fort Snelling is, but what it stands for. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think um, when you look at Fort Snelling, a lot of people would consider the start of the Civil War the Dred Scott decision. Um, so if you go back that far, and you wouldn't have the Dred Scott decision without his time in Minnesota. Um, and so I think so many people do not recognize his connection to Minnesota. And I'll admit, even living in St. Louis for 20 years, the narrative was always that he sued for his freedom because he went to Illinois. Um, so Minnesota was never part of the narrative that you were taught. And so I think it is really important to see that connection of Dred and Harriet Scott meeting in Minnesota and then eventually suing for their freedom. But I also think there's that larger story that you talked about um, in the previous session and we touched on a little bit here, it's the connection with the Native American community. Um, and so it is Minnesota, especially Fort Snelling is really this coming together of diverse cultures, not coming together peacefully, but coming together of a lot of different cultures. And I think that connection to the Civil War um, even though they fought on the North, you did have um, slaveholders who would bring their enslaved people North for vacations. Like that's how I remember first learning a little bit about Minnesota is they would travel North and bring their enslaved individuals with them. So even though they were a Northern state that fought for the Confederacy, I would claim that there was no state in the union that was not touched by slavery. I couldn't agree with you more, Melanie. And I think the interesting thing for me, having you know a recent transplant in Minnesota was coming here and having only read about the Dakota War from in 1862. So you know the Civil War occupies so much of our attention, we forget that Native peoples were still fighting for their liberty and trying to see um, in the midst of the Civil War an opportunity perhaps to create some distance, a much needed distance from the United States and its colonizing influence in the West. And so for me now, as I think about Fort Snelling and I, and I walk by there every day, there's a heavy energy for me there because 
people often try to make the connection between the Holocaust and slavery. And for many people, that's a problematic comparison. I think when you're talking about um, native peoples in the United States and you look at a structure like Fort Snelling and you consider what happened there and what it represents from the war to the executions to its use as a concentration camp, the reality is that is probably the closest comparison that we have and, and probably far more insidious because we don't talk about it in that way. Um, I, have, I can be appreciative of a structure and preserving a structure that's historically significant. But again, for me, Fort Snelling has always been, um, it remains problematic because it's a monument to white supremacy and the worst manifestations of white supremacy. The fact that you have a marker there commemorating two of the uh, leaders, uh, native leaders who were executed, um, who basically were not guilty of any crime other than you know, fighting for their liberty um, and, and you know, applying the same principles that the founders would have used and making their case against England. And then we celebrate this and somehow claim that it's inclusive just to include their images and to talk about those executions, to me is in and of itself problematic. I think that's why this moment when we're talking about George Floyd and we're thinking about his murder and we're talking about how we remember this moment, certainly I don't think anyone would suggest in 20 years that there should be a, a monument to Derek Chauvin in downtown Minneapolis to commemorate George Floyd in the same way that I'm increasingly uncomfortable with Fort Snelling becoming a representation of the Dakota War, when in fact, I think there are other ways to commemorate the rich history of the people who inhabited this space long before uh, white settlers came. Well, and I think that does kind of play into that, what are the role of historic sites? Are they, you know, something like Fort Snelling is so, um, it's a little different because it is a standing monument. It's not, a um, most of it isn't a reproduction, but you know, a standing monument and what took place on those grounds and how do you tell a complete story, you know, putting on my museum hat for a few minutes when people are in and out of there in 60 minutes and they're gonna go to what's comfortable. So even if, you know, and they are, even as Minnesota Historical Society is telling the story about Dred and Harriet Scott, they're telling the Native the stories that they're comfortable with. And so it's kind of like, how do we get people to understand to move away from their comfort level? Because they can't then say, this history was never taught. It was more that you avoided the history or you went to the history that made you feel good, as opposed to thinking about creating a more inclusive historical narrative. You know, I absolutely love that, Melanie, because I think this is the problem of the recolonization of the history. So we say, well, we're being inclusive because we're now telling the story of Black and Native people. But if we tell those stories in the context of conquest, then really what we're doing is reinforcing white supremacy. You know, to tell the story of Sally Hemings in no way uplifts or tells the story of African Americans on Monticello in any more than it is telling the stories of those who were vanquished in the Dakota War. I mean, we have to find a way to, to repurpose those sites and to tell that story in a way that's affirmative of the peoples and the culture. Um, and again, I think what you suggest is interesting because it's not inherently a critique on the folks at Minnesota Historical. It's a shift in thinking that has to take place among all of us, as you suggest, about how we really you know, engage as a community to think concretely about what these things mean and the, the internal damage they cause. I love telling the story about you know moving to Minnesota for the first time. You know, in 1988, the Washington Redskins won the Super Bowl. And my dad, I, I wanted a, a Redskins cap because the quarterback was Doug Williams and my last name was Williams. And I wanted to falsely claim him as a member of my family. I remember my dad becoming, you know, there was no way I was going to bring a Washington Redskins cap in that home because of that symbol and what it represented. I was too young at that time to appreciate how deeply that history hurt him being from South Carolina and having such deep connections to native peoples there. Now in retrospect, I look at that and I understand why Fort Snelling belongs in the same conversation as sports symbols, appropriation of black and native cultures, and why so many people say, you know, th this is time to turn the corner on some of these symbols. And, you know, the, the connections you're drawing between these shared histories is really powerful. And when you think about where Fort Snelling is, that it is built on a place that is sacred to Dakota people. When you think about the fact that Harriet Scott was enslaved by Lawrence Taliaferro, who was the Indian agent at Fort Snelling, and then tracing it through the Civil War and even um, thinking about the fact that Fort Snelling was used as a post for Buffalo soldiers who were then sent west to fight in the Indian Wars. And when you, when you see something like that, and when you think about the effect that this has on underrepresented communities and 
how do you how do you tell these stories and how do you do it correctly? How do you how do you honor a history like that? And I think this idea of you know honor and community and and trauma all really come together in really distinct ways. And in in that vein, why do you think this is happening now? Why are these monuments coming down now? You know, what made this that moment? Right. I really think this was kind of that straw that broke the camel's back. Because as I think if we could we think back um, to all of the previous um, police killings that the thing about this one, and part of it was probably a little bit of a pandemic, but I think more is just the tone and tenor of our current country. And I think people are just kind of tired. Um, I think whether it was Charlottesville, whether it was Tamir Rice, whether it was Dylan Roof, I mean, we unfortunately we can name way too many. And I think people have gotten to a point where they are like, this has to change. Um, and I think about it, are we at that turning point in American culture where this is one of those shifts that is happening? Um, I was talking about this with a girlfriend of mine and we were like, you know, we're of that age where we don't feel like we haven't had that change or that shift. And it's this one of those, because I think as a country, I think I can say we don't like complicated and we don't like change. <laughs> and we're going through both of those right now. There's no easy answers. And I think to Yahura's point, there were no discussions about any of this in the past when it happens, and now we are forcing those discussions in order to move forward. Hopefully, that will lead to change. Yeah, I, I agree, um, Melanie. You know, Americans like a tragedy with a happy ending, and we like our history told in digestible sound bites that always end with some appeal. And we're watching this play out in the national stage this week with the Democratic National Convention, and we'll watch the Republican version of that um, next week. But this idea that you know, at the core we're really, really good people and really well-intentioned people. Um, what you're suggesting, Katrina, which I think is powerful, is we have to tell these intersectional histories and they're messy. And they're messy in a way that, you know, I would really like to have a conversation about reparations, but then those reparations are based on stolen land. So this really gets messy and complicated very quickly. And if we're then thinking concretely about, you know, uplifting and talking about community trauma um, and the intersection of all of these different things, Maybe we're then in a space to think about investments in education and infrastructure um, and, and tackling and dismantling systemic racism in a way that allows us to think con concretely about how we uplift all communities. At the same time, we have to find a way to uplift and share the history of those people who've been marginalized, because otherwise the history of this country becomes the history of you know, colonizers and oppressors. And I don't say that in a way that you know, conservative pundits you know, dump on uh, people who want to have this conversation and go, that's your liberal ideology. I say that as a historian and a scholar who says, if you're not telling the complete story, then ultimately that narrative is flawed because it's giving an incomplete view of the people who ultimately built the, the infrastructure and the architecture of this nation. You know, that's the inescapable conclusion we all have to come to. And the fact that once you have you know, this type, this level of conversation, as you said, because for me, this began with the Confederate flag. I mean, I agree with you about Charlottesville and you know, people walking around and waving this as a proud symbol, seeing the stars and bars um, in Maryland at the State House, you know, that was an affront to my sensibilities as an American citizen and as an African American on both fronts. And so the monuments then became kind of the next logical step in saying, we gotta remove the flags, but the flags are the tip of the iceberg in terms of what this represents in terms of what we're memorializing, we're saying is significant and important about the heritage of these states. That is not significant, it's not important. I could tell those histories in very different ways, emphasizing the experience of women, of native peoples, of African-Americans, and it would be just as compelling, and I don't need a flag to do that or, or a monument to do that. Well, I think it does tie in so deeply to the educational system, and I say that because too many times you hear people saying, why didn't we learn this in school? And so it's kind of, you're kind of like, what did we do for 12 years in history? I mean, you would think there would be a larger call to totally upend the curriculum because that always seems to be the biggest rallying cry. I did not learn this until I went to college and took a specific course or read a book. This is not being taught in our schools. And so you have 12 years of history that then you have to kind of unteach in a way 
Um, and so people are looking to your monuments, memorials, museums, all of these other places to say, what did I miss here? What was left out of my education? And, and to your point, I think about Kerry Washington's comments last night at the convention where she says, I learned the preamble and she's able to recite it as we all are. You know, I think we're all constantly learning. I learned so much from Katrina and you last week in our conversation in prep. For, in fact, Katrina blew my mind. So there were some things that later on you go back and you look at it and you go, I thought that I had a pretty, you know, fairly good command of, of US history. And then you come to the conclusion that we're all in the process of learning. I, I love though, Melanie, that you're always able to look at this from the standpoint of this is a huge opportunity for us to decolonize the community. It's a huge opportunity, a curriculum, huge opportunity for us to think about how we can tell those stories in ways that complicate and invite young people to think about themselves as change agents rather than passive recipients of information. That's what I think challenged all of us in history class is that it was a collection of facts that felt more like social studies for the purpose of civic indoctrination as opposed to critical thinking for the purpose of building and uplifting communities. Yeah, no, I would agree. I like the idea. I like the way you put it in terms of civic indoctrination. And I also think we're underestimating our young people. As we can tell, they're the ones taking to the street demanding change, and we are underestimating that they do not understand nuance. <laughs> and you know, they have these questions, and I almost wonder, do they look at us like we're crazy? Like, we know that you're not telling us everything. Like, why aren't you giving us the entire story around this? And I, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of what you're saying is so dead on, and even. You, we, we are always learning, even as, as scholars and even as whether we're historians, whether we work in museum fields, whatever field we're in, you know, we're constantly learning and the ability to be able to do so and recognize that we need to do that is really powerful. And we just have a few minutes left before we go to questions. And this has just flown by. But the, the final question I want to pose to the two of you before we get into questions from the audience, what's next? We talked a little bit about how the Robert E. Lee statue has been transformed into a canvas, but what ne what's next? I think it's a great question. I'm gonna start in a weird space. Uh, um, I think it has to be going with conversa conversation and not canceling. Because I think when you forestall the conversation, what ends up happening is you just yank those things you know, up from their roots. And I want people to know why they're being taken down and the history they represent. It's meaningless to me if we don't have a larger conversation about why Fort Snelling's problematic, because that might be my one chance to get all those people who didn't get the 12 K-12 education we all imagine and hope they would get to really understand what systemic racism looks like. So I do feel conversation has to be a big part of this. I think, as you pointed out, Melanie, the lack of nuance and kind of the cancel impulse to just say, pull it down. Not that I don't think that they should come down, but I think that you have to have a process by which you know, what goes back up? I, my favorite story to tell about this is New Jersey Turnpike has rest stops named after historically significant people. And, you know, I used to joke that you could tell all of U.S. history through the Jersey Turnpike. The fact of the matter is no African-Americans, no people of color are represented in any way. A few women. You know, I always thought it'd be great if young people got to rename those rest stops after historically significant people to them. That'd be really powerful. Let's look at our school names. Let's, let's look at our street names. We have the technology now that there's no reason that you couldn't change the name of the street and somebody can still find their way to Graham Avenue if it's named after you know, uh, Marvell Cook and it's Cook Avenue. So I think in terms of activism, there's a huge opportunity for young people to say, we also claim this moment through study to move beyond this concept of you know, the James Lowen lies my teacher told me to, uh, you know, this is the work that we did in uncovering the history of our community as co-investigators and then reinterpreting and reimagining the names and the places we want to study, we want to live as, you know, models and things that we can aspire to of what we think are our core values. And I think in terms of what's next, it's also looking at, we recognize this is taking down the monuments or the memorials are not, is not going to eliminate systemic racism. So I think you'll hear critics say, oh, this is, you know, this is just superficial, but it's a step. It's the first step that a lot of people never thought would happen. Um, but I think we want to make sure um, that we don't lose sight of the actual goals. So, so taking down the monuments and memorials may be one step closer to the goal, but it's not um, the ultimate goal. 
Well, thank you both so much. This conversation has been really incredible. And I, I learned so much from both of you, not only in our conversations leading up to this, but today as well. And so I want to be mindful of time. And so we've got about 20 minutes left uh, for questions from the audience. And so what will happen is uh, we have folks working behind the scenes who have been collecting questions and making sure everything's ready to go for us. And so the question will pop up on the screen and then we'll take some time to answer it and we'll go from there. So Hugh McDevitt asked, um, you know, later in the converse, in the discussion, could you talk about the differences, if any, between these lost cause monuments in public places in the South and monuments for Southern regiments on Civil War battlefields? You know, I don't, again, when we talk about battlefields, that's what battlefields represent. So I don't necessarily have an issue with a battlefield like Gettysburg. Um, having regimental monuments to mark the troop placement or talk about significant battles in those spaces. I don't think that in any way glorifies um, the Confederacy or glorifies the lost cause. I think it's simply a reflection of where were troops placed, what happened in this space. I do think we have to tell the story about when those monuments were placed and by whom, and ultimately try to, um, uh, as Melanie said earlier, interrogate the symbols in those monuments because that in and of itself um, is significant. At the same time, you know, unrelated to that question, but certainly related to our larger conversation, the first thing that American uh, Marines did in Iraq was take down the statue of Saddam Hussein. You don't erect statues and you don't leave up the symbols of the, uh, for regime change, um, particularly when that regime is hostile to the very values or core values you claim you were fighting for. And in that sense, I do draw a sharp distinction between what happens on a battlefield where there's a, you know, marker a memorial to people who fought and died in that space as part of that battle and walking into the post office and, and being confronted with a, a statue of Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee. I think we have an image of this one, um, the emancipation um, statue in Washington, D.C. So. Um, for those who don't know, the Emancipation Statue in Washington, D.C., here's the image. Um, it was actually paid for by formerly enslaved um, African-American men and women. And so I think that's where um, there's this controversy around taking it down or putting it or uh, taking it down or leaving it up. And um, the African-American men and women were not involved in the actual design or determine the final design, just the funding. Um, so there is this ongoing discussion because this does not symbolize how you would envision emancipation from an African-American perspective. But at the same time, blood, sweat and tears went into um, from the African-American community went into the buying of this monument. So I think this one is a little this one's a little harder. It's not as I mean, none of them should be as clear cut, but this one definitely because this is something that was paid for by the African-American community. But the representation is problematic. You know, and I, I love that, Melanie, too, because I think this is one of those instances where maybe you, this is why that conversation before the canceling is, is so essential. Maybe there are steps that, that we could take toward uh, framing for this particular statue that tells that story, uh, that indicates the ways in which African Americans were desirous of having um, monuments that told the story of emancipation and what they'd achieved in the aftermath of emancipation, and then the way that the larger society, those in power, fought back to ensure images like this which would memorialize you know, the slaves as in some, uh, some sense um, half savages who were bought out of that state of, of bondage um, to civilization, which is really what this, this, um, this statue embodies. But I, I agree with you, this is, one of those pro this is one of those complicated ones because in that sense, you also don't wanna negate the agency that these um, people of color had in saying, no, we you know, raised this money in order to do this because we also recognize history is important and we want um, to be able to see ourselves and our history reflected, you know, those moments that are, are important to us reflected in the spaces where we are as well. So our next question comes from Stacy Seward. I'm hoping I pronounced your last name correctly. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican president that freed the slaves. Were the Republicans of Lincoln 
or do the Republicans of Abraham Lincoln represent the same platform as today's Republicans? Or was the Civil War more of a North versus South rather than Republican versus Democrat? And they're asking this question because they're seeing a lot of memes and a lot of things kind of floating around uh, about how the Republicans freed the slaves and they'd like to understand how true that is today. So it's it's great because there there's some wonderful scholarship on this. Um, I think the you know on maintaining and realigning elections on shifts in political parties over time, um, and the major shift that takes place within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party uh, after FDR is elected, in which the Republican Party becomes in some sense uh, or embraces this I ideology as the party of big business. But then much later on, during the period after the Civil War, will become the party that is the Goldwater Republicans, the party that doesn't support the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that doesn't want to intervene in what's happening in the South. The Democrats who have been the party of white supremacy, the party that had started the Civil War, um, then becomes the party that first through the New Deal and then much later on with John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson becomes the party that's pushing through and actually uh, stewarding um, civil rights legislation. So there's a shift that takes place in the political parties that we need to acknowledge. And so therefore those memes are misleading because they speak to events that are relative to parties as they existed in that historical moment, but are in no way reflective of what those parties represent or their, the agendas and goals and values that those parties represent today, or even what they represented 20 years ago or 40 years ago. They are constantly in flux and we have to you know, calibrate for that when we talk about that history. There's the party of Lincoln, and then there's the Republican Party, and and you know there's the party of Goldwater. They're very different uh, Republican parties. Right, and I think it's really important. Very similar as we've been talking about this entire time. Nuance: Lincoln did not free the slaves. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's what, but that's one of those things you learn in school. You learn Lincoln freed the slaves, and then you can move on to Christopher Columbus discovered America. Like so, that is not the case. And so I think it is about that nuance about what Lincoln actually did do. And I think more importantly, what Yahura said, it's about agency of African-Americans. So I like to, enslaved rose up to free themselves. It was not done to them. Um, so I think that's just really important as we're looking at language and saying that Lincoln freed the slaves. In fact, I just have to put this in there, Melanie, because you raise a great point. And I think it would be helpful for uh, the woman that asked that very important question. You know, part of the reason that that, um, Emancipation statute is so problematic is it doesn't capture exactly what Melanie's talking about in terms of the fact that the slaves actually precipitated a military crisis for the Lincoln administration in the midst of the war. Remember, Lincoln writes the Emancipation Proclamation in September of 62, but he needs a victory in order to issue that in January of 63. And he does that because his commanders in the field are writing to him because they've got three problems. Number one, they have a huge crisis by which they're there to prosecute a war, but every day you've got massive numbers of slaves who are showing up at union lines and saying, look, number one, we're here to fight, we're the rifles. Number two, we have a vested interest in that. My family is on this plantation or that plantation, and can we go liberate them? And number three, um, then you've got these slaveholders who are coming to the, the union army and saying, we demand our property, we demand that you get it. So Lincoln's commanders are writing to, to Washington, D.C. and saying, we need a clear, coherent policy here with regard to slavery, because we can't do our job um, by virtue of that. That's bought on by the agency of the slaves themselves. It's well documented in the work of the Freedmen and Southern Society Project out of University of Maryland, and a half a dozen books, if I had time, I could tick off for you um, in this moment, but I would start with the work of Barbara Jean Fields or Joseph Reedy. But the reality is, as Melanie says, and we really, you know, the reason I took the time just to mention that is, that's important history that people need to know. And if you don't know that history, then that flat narrative of Lincoln freed the slaves takes away from the complexity of what the, the Emancipation Proclamation was, a wartime measure, which was not the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation only frees those slaves in active rebellion against the Union. And it's, if I can just interject here as well, what's really fascinating about this narrative with Lincoln and one that we don't really get a, a good sense of is, you know, Lincoln gives the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863, just a couple weeks before then, he's the one that signs off on the execution of Dakota warriors at, in the wake of the war of 18, in the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. And so when you have these really complicated and complex narratives, you know, what we see in statues and what we see in memes, it doesn't necessarily convey all of that heavy history that comes with all of that as well. Um, and so we've got another question 
So Kathleen Ryan McMahon, Riley McMahon asks, is there a place in history for these movies and statues to teach the lessons of true and accurate history versus erasing them? You know, if we kind of think back to some of the things we talked about earlier with Gone with the Wind and Birth of a Nation, we can probably pull in, you know, the Robert E. Lee statue and other statues as well. So is, is there a place well, for them? It's interesting. So I think it was HBO. One of the channels now is doing a disclaimer for Gone with the Wind, which I find kind of amusing. Um, but I think someone who did it really well, I thought, was the Museum of Natural History, um, where they had a diorama that was very problematic related to um, Native American history. And instead of taking it down, they did an overlay to explain what was wrong. Because that's really important, because a lot of times people will say, I see that, and you're telling me this is wrong, but I don't know why it's wrong. And that was genius because you could say, "Here's here are all the historical inaccuracies in this piece. And so I think that's really important. You have to show people why it's wrong. Just taking it down doesn't explain why it was wrong to be put up in the first place. Yeah, I think we agree on that, Melanie, and that's that whole conversation versus canceling. The other thing is, Katrina, you just managed to blow my mind again. I mean, this is the problem with the shadow of Lincoln, as we understand, Abraham Lincoln. And that's, you know, again, I love that it came out at the Democratic Convention the other day where I can't, I think it was Michelle Obama says no one's perfect. So if we understand our history in these ways of talking about the imperfections, we don't build monuments to men. We build um, memorials to our values and our ideals, which we don't always live up, live up to. But there are opportunities for us to kind of revisit and understand the complexity of that. Lincoln, the great emancipator for me as a person of color growing up, is Lincoln the, the terrorist and the genocidal um, president to another group of people? And I don't know that history. And I really need to know both in order to understand how our country navigates its contemporary moment. So Alexandria Reyes asked, why was Bidet Makaska named Lake Calhoun anyway? Wasn't he from South Carolina? I wonder how that name got up here. So Calhoun is, is very significant um, as a states person in helping to clear the way for the settlement of the West. And it's really in that capacity that you know, he's acknowledged here. Uh, we can think about, you know, it's interesting, we talk about the history of Minnesota, not to move away from the question, but same would be true in conversations about Spanish Florida, where you had large um, native populations in which uh, escaped slaves often ran to those populations and, and were able to join them. And you know, really what Calhoun and others are doing is pursuing manifest destiny, which in and of itself at its core is a white supremacist notion that white peoples are somehow destined to um, control all the lands from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It begins with the Lewis and Clark um, and it continues through the period, but it really catches fire during the age of Jackson. And Calhoun is one of many states persons at that time. Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, Andrew Jackson himself were completing this bloody, um, work of completing the union, but at the same time decimating uh, native peoples in their wake. Um, even when they're challenged by the United States Supreme Court as they were in Worcester versus Georgia, even when the native populations fight back, um, and even when Mexico fights back, even when um, they have these internal challenges, and they even do so in the midst of their own civil war, um, as Katrina mentioned earlier. So th this is again, is that, that important history. So that's why he's represented here that lake is kind of named to honor that um, contribution. And just talking about it, again, reminds us about how complicated and really tricky this history is. And I think something that it just always reminds me when we talk about Bidet Makaska is they were able to frame the argument as a renaming. And I kept saying, it's not a renaming. The original name was Bidet Makaska. The renaming is Lake Calhoun. And I think that is that goes continues that narrative of being able to tell a certain story of how we are changing history when we're like we're changing history back to what it originally was. We are not changing the name. We're restoring the name. So that's where it shows that the language there really matters. So we just have time for one or two more questions. I know that you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of really great questions and I'm sorry that we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but if we have another one that we can bring up, um, Chris Lehman asks, between the removal of Confederate monuments and the renaming of locations honoring Confederates, do you consider one action to be more difficult than the other? 
I think they should be equally reflective. And I think that they should, should involve an equal amount of you know, people interrogating the meaning of that space of that name and what it is that they want to commemorate. I think the monuments get so much attention because there's the act of taking them down. You know, and then there's the scar that's left in their wake. Uh, so many people are uncomfortable with that because they're like, well, you know, I don't, if we're not going to have that there, then I'm, you know, what are we going to put in its place? I don't think you need to answer that question immediately. I think that's part of the problem is that we're too busy being concerned about what you, what you place there as opposed to removing the wound that's produced the narrative that causes its own kind of scars, which are invisible. Um, so I think really you have to balance the two, but I don't think there's a, a higher hierarchy in terms of, of, you know, um, ordering one over the other. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, I think that is really important. And we had talked about it earlier. We didn't talk about but in our previous conversations we did around the Equal Justice Institute and how they do have um, monuments to lynchings that happened in all 50 states. And the communities are welcome to come and pick up that memorial or that memorial but there is a lot of work you have to do to get that memorial. It is not, you just come pick it up and plop it in the space. There is a lot of community work that has to be done. And I'm pretty sure to this date, no one has picked theirs up because of that hard work that needs to happen. And the conversations that you heard and, and Katie or uh, Katrina are talking about in terms of having conversations about the values of your community and what this um, memorial would mean there. And so for those who, who might not necessarily be aware, the image we just saw referenced uh, a lynching that happened in Duluth, Minnesota um, in 1920. And you can see there the names of the three men who were hanged in Duluth. And, you know, the, the story of this lynching has, you know, MNHS did uh, a, some programming a little bit earlier this summer to kind of bring more attention to this. And so that's, you know, something else if you're interested in learning about MNHS has uh, a number of resources for that as well. And so we have time for just one more question uh, because we're almost at the end of our time. And so Martha Hoffman asked, you know, can't Fort Snelling be used as a learning experience like Monticello is being used to educate visitors about Thomas Jefferson's imperfections? So what do you think about that? You know, I think it can. I think the problem for me, and I'm gonna be very transparent and very personal here. I was at Fort Snelling the day after the riots erupted here in, in, in the Twin Cities related to George Floyd. And I could see the smoke rising from Minneapolis. And I was standing there with that kind of heavy feel. And I was looking down at the image of the two executed Dakota uh, leaders, warriors. And my heart felt very heavy. I don't know. Um, we just talked about this in terms of looking at the, the Duluth lynching of 1920. I remember two weeks after Mr. Floyd's murder, people being destabilized because we were talking about commemorating Juneteenth. We were talking about the Tulsa race riot of 1921. We were talking about the Duluth lynching. And I can't tell you how many people said they didn't know that history. The problem with the Monticello approach for Fort Snelling is that Jefferson is a big enough name and a big enough draw that you can assume that there's traffic there is sufficient to drive a conversation that would warrant you know, the maintenance of that space. Him being With Fort Snelling, the problem is how many people actually visit that site? How many people have taken the time to interrogate that history? How many people think about the legacy of that space? It's not that I'm opposed to thinking through that but I think it would have to be done in concert with uh, the Dakota people and thinking about um, in, in a very um, concrete way, what are other ways that we can start to address some of the historic injustices that remain rather than just talking about this historical moment. A little easier to do that in Monticello, I think for, for obvious reasons, but here, and again, for me, I think it's intensely personal because of what we all experienced um, several months ago. It's just gonna be hard for me to ever wipe out in my mind having run by that fort for Ahmed Aubrey, having watched George Floyd be murdered um, along with the rest of the nation, and then standing there and recognizing that I was standing on a space where you know untold document uh, numbers of people um, had suffered and died with a knee on their neck, to borrow a phrase. I think, I think there's always the potential for education. And as someone who kind of programmed or worked with the staff who programmed that space for three years, I think we did do a lot of good work. And I say that thinking of when we brought Joseph McGill, who's the slave dwelling project where he spent the night in Dred Scott's um, room. And we had a wonderful program out there talking about slavery. And um, one of my favorite programs where we brought Michael Twitty and Sean Sherman 
talking about indigenous food culture. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. So I feel like there is the potential there, but it's one of those things where you have to be really deliberate to your point, you You have to be deliberate about the intersectionality and it can't be all military, all enslaved, all native, but you have to bring, you have to bring the programming together to show how they interacted. Well, thank you both so much. It was, uh, it's been wonderful to be able to talk with you and to be able uh, to give you a space to share all of this wonderful knowledge that you have. And before we go, uh, I just want to make note of just some kind of things for our audience to keep in mind. So we want to make sure that we give folks some ideas for action steps for the future. And every community is different. So we encourage you to find out what you need to do in your own community. And for those who are viewing locally here in Minnesota, feel free to mention resources that you found in the chat so that this that they can be recorded and shared later. And we've also included the link to the cat boards form for receiving input from the public. And so once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Melanie Adams and Dr. Yohara Williams for joining me here today. And thanks to all of you who joined us as well. Uh, a recording of today's discussion will be posted on the Minnesota Historical Society's Facebook page and YouTube channel. And if you're interested in the next series, uh, so you can always join me on September 24th when I'll be joined by Dr. Jean O'Brien, an author and a scholar whose most recent book is Monumental Mobility, The Memory Work of Massasoit, where we'll be talking about historical erasure. And so miigwech, thank you, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.